All right, here we go. Now we're ready. Happy Father's Day. Welcome, everybody, to Boulevard Community Church. Happy Father's Day. So it is Father's Day. Go ahead and put that up there, uh, Edgar. Happy Father's Day to all of our fathers. And But, you know, before we say Happy Father's Day, I think Mother's Day came first, right? So we definitely have to say Happy Mother's Day to all of our moms. You guys should be more excited than this. I tell you, it's Mother's Day. We'll put it up Mother's Day because the reason is we weren't here. We weren't here to be able to worship, to celebrate uh, mothers, so we're going to do that today. So if I can have Jeff, Jeff, come on over here real quick. Come on down. You're going to help. You're going to help me out here. So we, I'm going to have Jeff get his exercise and get his big old Santa Santa bag here and give everybody here, mothers and fathers, a, a bag of popcorn. Okay. We love you. It's kettle corn. You guys, I hope you guys like kettle corn. Who doesn't like kettle corn? If you don't like that kettle corn, we're going to go into prayer right now. Okay? So, happy Mother's Day. Happy Father's Day to all of you. Uh, let me just say a couple of things. If you are a guest with us this morning, I don't see any. I see one guest, so welcome to our church. We're excited that you're here. Uh, do me a favor, Mariah, even though I know you. Um, there's a uh, Let's Get Acquainted card in the, in the, the chair uh, right there in front of you. Fill it out, and then um, you can give it to me later on, and we can put you in the system and let you know more of what's going on in the life of the church. So, welcome everybody. Uh, hope everybody had a great week. A couple of things to announce that we're having uh, uh, in the church is uh, people are still asking about small groups. Start a Zoom meeting or Google Hangouts, things like that. Talk to your small group leader. I want to uh, remind you and encourage you about that. Uh, food ministry is happening when? This Saturday is food ministry, and so I want to encourage uh, to come out and help out with that. Let's see what else is happening. I can't think of anything else that's happening. Um, BBS was, is canceled, obviously, which was supposed to be last week. Keep that in prayer. And, and listen, I'm going to ask that, um, that we all pray, that we all really stop and pray. There's so much going on in our world. It's, it's kind of really getting overwhelming. Uh, for us, and so we really need to stop and pray and seek the Lord's face, seek his power, seek his strength, seek his peace. You know, Jesus said this, come all to me who are weary and heavy laden. And what did he say? What was the promise? And I will give you rest. And so I, I, at least me personally, I need to be able to rest. Uh, my spirit needs to rest with the things that I've seen going on in our, in our world, in our country, in our communities. And so let's just pray. Uh, for everybody. So if you're ready to worship this morning, let's stand and let's uh, get to prayer and worship the Lord. Jeff, you're all good? I'm out. All right, we're going to pray right now. So let's pray then. <laughs> <laughs> all right, excellent. Father God, we just come before you. We thank you so much for the opportunity to come and, and seek your face. Father, to taste and see that the Lord is good. Father, we love you. We thank you that in the midst of things that are going on in our world, Father, that we can stop and be still and know that you are God. Father, I pray for that you will give us peace, that you will comfort our hearts during this difficult time. Father, show us to remain faithful. Father, your son Jesus told his disciples that we will be persecuted. There will be times of trouble. But do not be troubled. Do not let our hearts be troubled. But Father, because you have overcome the world. And Father, we rely, we believe, and we trust in that truth. We trust in the very words of Jesus that came out of his mouth. That he overcame the world. And so, Father, we thank you. We thank you that you are going to take care of your people. Father, be uh, with our police officers. Be with those that are out there protesting peacefully. Father, be with our president and our local officials. Father, give them wisdom, courage, and strength. Father, to lead, to not just to look at politics, but Father, look at the people of who they represent. Father, I pray that for your intervention in this time. We humble ourselves. Seek your face. Father, I pray that you'll heal our land. We love you, we thank you, we praise you that you call us friend, that we have a great friend in Jesus, and it's in his name I pray, and everyone said, 
Amen. Let's sing this morning.
Good morning. Good morning. Today our scripture is be, uh, from Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 7, if you'd like to turn to that. As for you, you were dead in your trespasses and sins, in which you used to live when you followed the ways of the world and the ruler of the kingdom of the world, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also live among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath, but because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Jesus, even when we were dead in our trespasses. It is by grace that you have been saved, and God raised you up with Christ and seated you with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus, in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace, expressing it in the kindness to us in Jesus Christ. Shall we bow? Dear most gracious and heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for all that you do. We thank you for the words of Paul, and we thank you, Father, that uh, for his example and how he changed and turned his life around, just like we could do with our lives. Lord, we just pray that you would be with us and that you would help us to be mindful of the service today. Help us to absorb your word and take it in. Lord, at this time, we want to lift up uh, the offering. Uh, for those that uh, contribute, we pray, Father, that those people that give online would continue to do so, just as the people that come to church would uh, put it up here at the front, and that it could be collected, Father, so that we could uh, multiply your word, not only here in the Antelope Valley, but throughout the, the, the world. Lord, we praise you, and we thank you, we just ask that we would be faithful during these difficult times, and that you would see us through, help us to trust completely in you, for in Jesus' name we pray and give thanks. All right, well, I don't know about you, but I hope you're ready to get into God's Word. Amen? Amen? All right, if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Mark chapter 5. We're going to look at verses 21 through 24, and then we're going to skip that middle part. We're going to go to verses 35 through 43. We're continuing this series, Your Setback is Your Setup. And I've heard a lot of great response on this series because there is a lot of things that are happening in each and every one of our lives that seems to be, and it looks like, a setback. But we have to be reminded in God's word that this setback that we are experiencing is a setup. It is God setting us up for something greater. It is God setting us up for a great deliverance. You know, we are going through very difficult times, but when I read my word, I believe what God's word says, that there is going to be a great deliverance. Now, I don't know exactly what that great deliverance is going to look like, but I know that there is going to be a great deliverance. And so here's a whole subtitle of this is don't be afraid, church. Don't be afraid. Just believe. These are words that came out of Jesus's mouth that Mark writes down, more than likely being told the story to Mark by Peter. But Mark makes sure that he writes those words down that he tells Jairus. And what an interesting, uh, I don't want to say coincidence, it is divine in my opinion, in my uh, faith in God, that this message is coming up on Father's Day. Where Jairus is a synagogue ruler and he is experiencing a great tragedy in his life, a great setback in his life. Where his little girl is dying. Now, one of the things we have to remember is that when Mark writes these things, these things that he wrote previous to this story, with, with, with the whole uh, calm, Jesus calming of the storm, with the whole uh, issue with the demon-possessed man, and now Jairus comes over to him and says that his, his daughter is dying, and then that while Jesus is going, we saw last week that, that Jesus uh, is confronted, he is touched, the hem of his garment is touched by a woman who has an issue of blood. And he stops and has a conversation with her and makes sure that she is comforted by calling him, calling her daughter. And then now we see what we're going to look at today of what happens with Jairus, the synagogue ruler, and, and what happens to this little girl. You know, a lot of times, church, the main idea of this message is that when we are at the outer edge of our setback, Go ahead and put that up there on the main idea there, Edgar. When we are at the outer edge of our setback, that setback is an opportunity 
for only God to make a difference through our setup. It, it's, it's, we're experiencing this setback, and a lot of times we think that, oh, everything is over. Jarius came to a point to where he was pleading with Jesus because his little girl is dying. And I'm, I'm going to jump ahead a little bit. We know the story is that what happens is that Jesus is talking to the woman with the issue of blood whom, whom her faith has healed her. She, he's now having a conversation and people from Jairus' uh, home come to him and says, you know, forget about it. Forget about Jesus coming over because your daughter is dead. In other words, it's over. And I don't know about you, but many times in my life, when I feel that things are over, God turns around and says, no, this is now my opportunity. Amen. I don't know about you, but when things seem like they are over, where it's all said and done, God reminds me, and hopefully he's reminding you, that it's not over, it's an opportunity. Amen. God is setting up an opportunity in your life. So don't be afraid. Just believe. Let's get into that passage, starting with verse 21. Listen to what it says. It says, when Jesus had again crossed over by the boat to the other side. So he's making his way, going to the boat from one side of the lake to another. He's on a mission. It says, a large crowd gathered around him. And while he was by the lake, then one of the synagogue rulers named Jairus came there. Seeing Jesus. Listen to that. Seeing Jesus. Seeing Jesus. Church, we need to be able to see Jesus. Even though we can't see him physically, but we can see him in the word. We can see him in our spirit. We can see him around us. We can see him in our lives. We need to see Jesus. And look at the response that Jerry said. What he did. He fell at his feet. I wish more Christian folks who claim to know Jesus, who claim to see Jesus, who claim to follow Jesus, would fall at his feet. Jairus was the ruler of the synagogue. He was a Jew. He was a part of the religious set. But he sees Jesus and he falls at his feet. Listen to what it says. And he pleaded earnestly. Earnestly. He pleaded earnestly with Jesus. He didn't say, dear Lord, thank you for this day. We we praise your name in the name of Jesus. He didn't say that. He cried out. He was on his knees and he had his hands up and he was pleading. Why was he pleading? Listen to what it says. He was pleading with him. My little daughter is dying. My baby girl is dying. I know there are people in our, in our church that experience that. My baby girl is dying. My little daughter is dying. He says, please come and put your hands on her so that she will be healed and live. And so Jesus went with him. And I want to skip down to verse 34. Actually, verse 35. Jesus is talking to the woman with the issue of blood. Tells her, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be free from your suffering. It says, while Jesus was still speaking, some men came from the house of Jairus, the synagogue ruler. Your daughter is dead. It's over. <laughs> Why bother the teacher anymore? You see, Jairus saw Jesus as a healer. But the people who didn't really believe, they saw him as just a teacher. But listen to what Jesus says. He says, ignoring. My translation says, ignoring. Other translations say, overhearing. But here's what it is. Jesus heard what they said. He heard their unbelief. And he says, to the, told to the synagogue ruler, Jairus, he says, don't be afraid. Just believe. Don't be afraid. Just believe. He did not let anyone follow him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. And when they came into the home of the synagogue ruler, Jesus saw a commotion with people crying and wailing loudly. These people who are, are paid, and that's what they do. They come around when they hear that somebody passed away. They go into the house and they do the crying and the wailing. In other words, it's fake. And Jesus says this. It says he saw this, that when they came to the home of the synagogue ruler, Jesus saw a commotion 
with people crying and wailing. And he went in and said to them, why all this commotion and wailing? Oh, listen to this church. The child is not dead, but asleep. The child is not dead, but asleep. They had just told Jairus that it is over. Your child is dead. And Jesus is saying, she's not dead. She's just asleep. This is an opportunity. And then it says here in verse 40, but they laughed at him. They saw this statement that Jesus said as silly. They saw this statement that Jesus said as foolish, but he had just got done telling the, the father, don't be afraid, just believe. In other words, have faith. They, what they think is foolish, but if you have faith, I'm gonna show you something different. It continues on, it says, after he had put them all out, he took the child's father and mother. See, happy Father's Day. Happy Mother's Day. He kicked everybody else out, but he took mom and dad. And, and James and, and Peter and John were there. And he took the child's father and mother and the disciples who were with him and went where the child was. He took her by the hand and said to her, Talitha kum, which means little girl, I say to you, get up. Notice he didn't pray over her. He didn't anoint her with oil or anything like that. He gave her a command. Little girl, you're not dead. You were just asleep. Get up. I'm going to get into that here in a minute. I need to calm myself down because I get so excited about this passage. Immediately, which is something that Mark always writes, immediately, it didn't take a week, it didn't take a, a month, immediately this little girl got up because she heard the very words of Jesus. In church, we need to hear the very words of Jesus. Get up! Get up from your sleep. Get up from your dead self. Get up from what is happening to you. You're not dead. You're just asleep. Get up. And immediately the girl stood up and walked around. She was 12 years old. Barely starting her womanhood. She was 12 years old. At this they were completely astonished. And he gave strict orders not to let anyone know about this. And told them to give her something to eat. Brothers and sisters, I want to just wish everybody here a happy Mother's Day and a happy Father's Day. When God is, when you are experiencing a setback, God is setting you up for something greater, a great deliverance. The question is, is how do we respond to that setback? That's been the whole theme of this series. How do we respond to the setback? The first point I want to make this morning is point number one. As fathers, as mothers, we need to be ready to take a risk. It is amazing to be able to see what is happening here in this passage, in this story, in this narrative, where Jairus is a synagogue ruler. He is a leader in the religious sect, the Jewish sect that is happening, that is totally wanting to kill Jesus. But when it comes to his baby girl as a father, he can care less of what is happening around him. And he sees Jesus and he pleads with him. He is ready to take a risk. Church, I want to ask you this morning that whatever it is that's going on in your life, are you ready to take a risk? When it comes to following Jesus, it is a risk. Now, what was the things that some of the things that Jairus risked? He risked his reputation. I don't know about you, but many of us, when you come to Christ and you follow Christ, you risk your reputation. I used to be a person that used to drink and party with my friends, and I had to risk that reputation of how I was to be this now Bible club for Jesus free. I didn't care. I was willing to risk it all. Are you willing to risk your religion? When I became a follower of Christ, we were persecuted by our own family because they were mainly Catholic. You're going against your religion. You're going against our Catholicism. You're going to now be a Southern Baptist. What in the world is that? We live in California. I said, yeah, but we live in Southern California. That's why we're Southern Baptists. <laughs> but you got to be ready to risk your religion. That's what Jerry said. He was ready to just, he didn't care because his little girl was dying. We need to take a risk when it comes to our resources. 
Many of you know that I worked for the city of Los Angeles. We were making good money. Even though we were making good money, we were always broke because we spent it frivolously. I was buying 36 packs of beer at Costco. Every single weekend, that was my plan. That's what I was going to do. I didn't care if I had the, uh, the, the water bill. I didn't care if I had the cable bill or the electricity bill. I needed to have my 36 pack of Miller Lite. And I was making good money. But when God called me to the ministry, I had to take that risk and give up my resources. Because see, when Jesus saved my life, when I pleaded to him to save my soul, I didn't like the way I was living, I had to take a risk. Church, are you ready to take that risk with your resources? I saw people coming up with their tithe and I'm looking at the, at the plates and they're, they're getting full. We need to be those people who are tithing to teach those who are not. Listen, you gotta learn how to take a risk. You gotta be ready. If you're gonna follow Jesus, you gotta surrender all. Not just a little bit. When it comes to a little bit, that's your faith. But when it comes to following Jesus, it's surrender all. Your resources. Jairus was ready to, to risk his relationships. Relationships are a thing that a lot of times we want to we keep. We want to hold on to. But if they don't want to support that you are now a follower of Christ and you come to church and you're ministering in the, in the life of the church and, and you're praying and you're starting small groups in your house and you can't have your friends come over and drinking beer and things like that because you got Bible study. You replace beer with Bible. You're going to lose some relationships. And you got to be willing to risk them. Jairus was ready to risk his relationships with his synagogue friends and family. There were thousands of people, crowds of people, and here comes this synagogue ruler. Jairus comes over and he falls to the feet of Jesus. Church, that was a no-no. That was considered blasphemy. He was now worshiping somebody else rather than, quote, God, but little did he know that he was worshiping God. He was pleading with God in the flesh. But see, when it comes to his little girl, when it came to the outer edge of his situation, when he looks like it was all over and he was about ready to fall over, he needed somebody to carry him and pick him up. He needed somebody to save him. Church, I don't know if it's about you, but have you ever felt like this in your life where you're just about ready to just go over the edge? Some of you are looking at me right now like, Jerry, be careful. Your knees are weak. That's how it feels like sometimes. It feels like you, you just don't know how to think anymore. It feels like you just don't know what to do anymore. You don't know who to turn to. You don't know where to go. And listen, Jairus went to Jesus because he saw him. And he didn't care when it came to his little girl. He was ready to risk his relationships. Church, the last one here is that he's ready to risk routine. See, a lot of times when it comes to, especially church folks, we want to keep things the same. We want to hold on to tradition. But when it comes to the life of another person, we need to let go of that routine. We need to let go of that tradition. We need to be ready to take a risk because there is a soul that is out there that doesn't know Jesus and they're destined to hell. And the scripture says that those who will go to hell, that's the what? The second death. Those who are in Christ Jesus will no longer die. Yes, we die here on this earth, but that's it. We no longer die. We are alive. We transition from this life here on earth, death to life. So we got to be willing to just let go of our routines. I struggle with that. Sometimes I struggle where every Sunday it seems like we do just the same thing over and over and over again. Just like the song said, over and over, over and over, over and over. I'm not going to sing it because I want, you know, Leo sings a lot better than I do. <laughs> we got to be ready to risk those routines. Jesus says this in Mark 8, 35. He says, for whoever wants to save their life will lose it. You want to hold on to your traditions. You want to hold on to your routine, your reputation, your religion, your resources, your relationship. You're going to lose it. But whoever loses their life, their reputation, religion, resources, relationships, routines, for me and for the gospel will save it. 
Church, are you ready to risk? Are you ready to risk it all for Jesus? Are you ready to risk it all for somebody to come to know Christ as their Lord and Savior? For somebody to experience life? We have to be ready to risk it. Number two is this. You have to believe it to receive it. Church, did you know that your belief is proportional to your blessing? If you don't believe something, you're not going to experience the blessing. You have to believe it to receive it. Listen to what verse 35 says. While Jesus was still speaking, some men came to the house of Jer from the house of Jairus to the synagogue ruler. Your daughter is dead, they said. Why bother the teacher anymore? Think about that. Here you are pleading with Jesus. Jesus says, all right, let's go. I'm going to paraphrase. They're on their way. This woman touches his, his robe. He stops. There's power that came out of him. He wants to know what's going on. Then he starts having a conversation. It doesn't really say how long that conversation is. But this woman, this man's daughter is dying. And Jesus is there having a conversation with the woman. Jerry showed great patience. I don't know about you. But when it comes to believing in order to receive, we need to have patience. We need to wait on God. Can you imagine hearing those words? Some of us heard those words. Your daughter is dead. We experienced those words. And it would seem like it was over. Jesus turns to him and says, don't be afraid. You see, the first thing that comes into your heart is fear. And Jesus says, look, don't let that fear get the best of you. Because what happens with fear is that fear will actually stop you. Will want to pull you away from your purpose. He says, don't be afraid, just believe. Now, a lot of times when I say that word believe, when I hear that word believe, that word believe means to trust. Many times we could come to church and hear the message and hear the word and go, yeah, I believe that. But when Jesus is telling Jairus, don't be afraid, just believe. In other words, continue to follow me and trust me and watch what I'm going to do. You have to trust. You have to have a desire to be able to receive that blessing that God has for you. Yes, you can believe it by coming to church, singing a few songs, putting in your tithe, praying for a couple of times, and then walking out of this door. And say, well, yeah, that was a good message. I believe it. In other words, I agree with it. But it's much more than just agreeing with it. It's actually trusting it. Having that desire to see it. And if you have that desire to see it, then you have to be disciplined in it. You want to see a blessing from God? You've got to start showing discipline. Discipline in coming to church, getting into the word, being disciplined in prayer, being disciplined in tithing, being disciplined in following him. Why? Because you desire it. There's something there that you want, even though you may not be able to see it. It doesn't look like you'll be able to accomplish it. It's too hard. It's too much work. I don't know if I can get there. Listen, we have to be disciplined and it takes diligence. It reminded me when I went to Cal Baptist and pursuing this degree, I had to drive an hour and 45 minutes to get to Cal Baptist. And after a month, I wanted to give up. I had the desire. I thought I had a little bit of the discipline, but did I have the diligence? You see, and then next thing you know, two and a half years later, after looking at that long list of all these classes that I had to take, I said, oh man, this is not gonna happen. It's gonna take forever for me to get that degree. But see, what it took was diligence. I had to get up every single day and go and drive down there and do my homework, sit there for four hours, sometimes four and a half hours, come home, get out of class at 1030 at night and drive all the way home. I wouldn't get home till 12 in the morning. And then I have to wake up at 334 o'clock to go to work. Diligence. You see, a lot of times when you see people coming to degrees, it's not so much really that they were smart. Because I've met a lot of people who have master degrees, doctor degrees, and they're dumb as, I'm gonna stop right there. <laughs> so somebody said amen or that's right, I heard it. So you know where I'm going. But why do they get that degree? Because they were diligent. 
they saw what they desired, whether they learned anything or not. Matter of fact, you're looking at one right now. I'll say it, I'm as dumb as rocks. I remember I spoke to my pastor the first time I went to AV High, uh, AV High School, AV, what is that called? AV College, AVC. And I had my first test. I hadn't gone to school in 20 years. I, could, I didn't even know if I knew how to read or how to take a test. And so I'm sitting in the parking lot. I am a nervous wreck. It was Communications 101, and I had a test that I had to take. It wasn't speaking. I didn't have to speak. I had to do a written test. And I was so nervous, and I'm sitting in the parking lot, and I called my pastor. I said, Pastor, I'm nervous as, as, as can be. I don't know what to do. And he said, Jerry, those of you guys know her, Jerry, he said, Jerry, now here's what you need to do. He says, you need to stop what you're doing. You need to pray. And this is what you need to tell the Lord. You say, God, you know I'm as dumb as a box of rocks. <laughs> so I need your help in taking this test. And you being the great follower and disciple of my pastor, I hung up the phone and I sat there and I said, God, you know I'm as dumb as a box of rocks and I need your help. I was nervous, I was scared. But Jesus said, don't be afraid, just believe. And I went in there with a desire to pass that test. That's what I wanted to do. I wanted to pass that test. And not only that, I wanted to get an A on that test. And not only that, I wanted to get 100% on that test. And so I had a desire and I was disciplined in my study and I was diligent in going in and taking that test. And that was my first test that I've taken in 20 years. And guess what I got? Now remember, I'm dumb in a box of rocks. I got 100%. I'll never forget that. That's where I knew, God, you called me to the ministry, and I'm going to be diligent. I'm going to follow you, and I won't be afraid. I'll just believe. You see, it takes faith. But James says in chapter 2, verse 17, in the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, it's dead. It's dead. We can have the faith, we can believe, but we have to get up and we have to be diligent in following Christ, even when it looks like it doesn't look like it's going to happen. Church, do you have the ability to believe it in order to receive it? And then point number three is this. Point number three is this. All this happens, this is the setup. All this happens is for Jesus to reveal his mercy, his sympathy, and his power. The mercy, the sympathy, and power of Jesus. Look at what these verses say. Go ahead and put it up there, Edgar. My, my notes went, went dead again. There it is. It says, he took her by the hand. Verse 41. He took her by the hand. He took her by the hand. He had mom and dad with there. There was mercy. Did Jesus have to go and heal this young girl? Who was Jairus? He was a synagogue ruler. He was a person that was at one time persecuting Jesus. Jesus could have said, no, you're one of those religious Jewish people that want to try to kill me. But he didn't do that. He showed mercy. I remember I was a persecutor among the Christians. I see some of my coworkers pray before their lunch and I would mock them and I would persecute them because of their faith. And that's what Jairus was. He was a mocker, he was a persecutor. He was part of the religious sect, wanted to kill Jesus, but Jesus had mercy on him and went with him. And he took his little girl, his little daughter by the hand he says, Talitha kum, which means little girl. What's interesting is that Aramaic translation that Mark says, another translation, it says little lamb. Little lamb. He had this sympathy. This was a man's little girl. This was a mother's little daughter. And he has sympathy on her. Because see, Jesus understands what happens. Because he's God and he's going to understand what it happens to lose with your own begotten son. Jesus has sympathy because he knows and he understands when people are hurting. He has sympathy. So your setback is a setup for Jesus to reveal his mercy on you. Sympathy, and here it is, and his power. 
He says, little girl, get up. And immediately the girl stood up and walked around and she was 12 years old. At this, they were completely astonished and he gave strict orders not to let anyone know about this. Which is kind of interesting, is that secrecy motif that Mark always writes. But just a little bit earlier, when the demon-possessed man was, was, was freed from the demons and the demons went into the pigs, Jesus tells him, now go and tell what the Lord has done for you. And he goes to the Decapolis and he goes and tells all these people and people believed. They were astonished. They were amazed. But now he's telling this family, don't tell anybody. Don't let, don't let anyone know about this. And then he tells them, listen to this, give her something to eat. Give her something to eat. Give her her strength. Not only that, there's something special about food. I don't know about you, but when we are grieving, when we were grieving and with our loss, there was people that were coming into over to our house and just giving us food, giving us something to eat. There's something about food that can comfort us. Now, there is something that when we eat too much food, when the food overtakes us, then that's when we get in trouble. But Jesus wants to show his power. He told the little girl, get up. He didn't listen to those people who told him, that told Jerry, you don't have to come. Let the teacher go on his own. Let him do his own thing. Your little girl is dead. And then when he comes into the house, there are people wailing and crying over this little girl that they don't even know. They don't even know Jerry. And he kicks them out. Isn't it amazing? That sometimes there are people in your life that aren't going to encourage you, help you believe, help you receive that blessing. They're just there to mock you, to try to cause doubt in your life. Listen, church, do me a favor and do God a favor. Get those people out of your life. Amen. Kick them out of your house. All they're trying to do is cause dissension between you and God and your family and your situation. Kick them out the way Jesus did. And let Jesus reveal that mercy, sympathy, and power. You see, he has mercy, church, because he cares for you. I don't know what's going on in your life. But let you know this. You can trust in this word that Jesus has mercy for you. Why? Because he cares for you. Cast all your cares upon Jesus. Why? Because he cares for you. Give it to him. It's one of Don Mohan's favorite church matter of verse. Matter of fact, that's his life verse. Am I right? right? Why? Because he cares for you. Jesus cares for you. He has mercy upon you. Those of you who are sitting here were dead in your sin. Like David just read, you were dead in your trespasses, in your sin, in your transgressions. You were dead. And because of Jesus, you are now made alive in Christ. Somebody told you, which is the Holy Spirit, came into your heart and said, get up. Stop living this dead life and come follow this Jesus who was alive and watch him change his life. Listen, he cares for you. Did God have to save me? No. I should have been dead or in prison right now. And I'd rather have been dead, but then again, if I would have been dead, I would have been in hell. So maybe prison would have been a little bit better because prison, I still have a chance to come to Jesus. Church, we need to show mercy to people. We need to show that care for people. We need to have sympathy the way Jesus did. Why? Because he understands our situation. Jesus has sympathy right now. He understands your situation. He understands your setback. But then he's going to set you up so that you can see his power. He has power, church. He has authority. In chapter 6, you're going to see that people started questioning Jesus' authority. Isn't it interesting that he just got done calming the storm? He has authority over nature. He just got done uh, 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 taking this demon out of this man who was possessed with demon. Jesus has authority over evil. And then there's this woman with the issue of blood who was bleeding for 12 long years. And she just says, if I could just touch the hem of his robe, I will be healed. And Jesus has authority over sickness. And then here comes this man who says, my little girl is dying. And he goes into the house, kicks everybody out, takes mom and dad and the other disciples, grabs the little girl's hand and says, get up. 
because he has power, he has authority over death. Church, I am finished with this message because God has spoken to all of us. Do you believe, Jesus said? Do you believe? Because a time is coming and in fact has come when you will be scattered each to your own home. You will leave me all alone, yet I am not alone, for my Father is with me. I have told you these things. Listen to why Jesus told us these things in John 16, 31 through 33. So that in me, in me, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace in this world. You will have trouble, but take heart. I have overcome the world. Why? Because Jesus has power and authority over this world. Amen. Let's stand this morning so we have our time of invitation. Woo. Oh man, 1030 people, you better warn them when you see them in the parking lot, warn them. They're going to hear it today. That's right. They're going to hear it today. We have a God who is so powerful, so amazing. And I hope and pray that we have a church that believes, that trusts in Jesus, trusts that he overcame the world. We have to rebuke the evil one. In the name of Jesus, we have to rebuke Satan from our lives because he has no power over us. When Jesus, when he was being tempted by Satan, what did Jesus say? Get behind me, Satan. You have no power over me. And we can say the same thing. Get behind me saying you have no power over me because Jesus has overcome the world. He has authority over you. We have to believe. We have to believe that Jesus suffered and died on the cross. We have to believe it. Blessed are those who believe and do not see. I believe because people have wrote it down. They were persecuted. They were killed over this word. There were people after Jesus that read this word, preached this word, and they were killed. Why? Because they believed. And when they believed, they received that blessing. So today, church, we have an opportunity to believe in Jesus, that he suffered and died on the cross. And that he was raised from the dead. And Paul says, if you confess with your mouth, those things, you will be saved. But you have to believe. So I have a prayer up on the screen that I want to share with you. Where you just come to God and say, God, I know I am a sinner. And today I ask for your forgiveness. I receive Jesus as my Lord and my Savior. And the proof of my belief is that I give you my life. Give it to him. Everything. Surrender it all. Every single thing. Your children, your house, your wallet, your bank account, your car. Everything that is about you. Your health, your wife, your husband. Everything, your children. Everything that you have about you. You give it to him. I give you my life. Church, listen. Trust me. Believe in what I'm saying as a testimony. Is that when you give Jesus everything. He'll give you his everything. What's that song? You can have all this world, but give me Jesus. That's all I need. I don't know how people can function in this world without Jesus. And you can see how they respond when it comes to tragedy. You can see how they respond when it comes to difficulty and persecution. Church, are you ready to risk it? Are you ready to believe it in order to receive it and see the power and mercy and sympathy of Jesus? Then I'm going to ask you to pray that prayer. Pray that prayer today and receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior. After we sing this last song, if there's anybody that prayed that and wants to receive Jesus today or maybe rededicate their life to Jesus, want to start following Jesus, you understand more, then come and see me after the service and I'll talk with you and pray with you. Let's sing this morning as we allow the Lord and the Holy Spirit to work in our lives. Let's sing.
We love you. We'll see you next week.